In the church year, we have just entered a new season. We are now in the season of Eastertide, literally meaning after Easter. This is the first Sunday after Easter and we'll be in this season until Pentecost. Pentecost this year falls on May 23rd. It's the day when the Holy, we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming to the people of God. So between now and Pentecost, we're going to be looking at John's first letter, the Apostle John's epistles. It is a message to Christians about Jesus Christ. John is an amazing message, and it couldn't be more appropriate for us today. However, to understand John, you have to look closely at the time in which John was writing. You need to understand the historical context. John was a disciple of Jesus, probably the youngest of the disciples. He lived the longest, and he wrote this particular letter around A.D. 85. That's 50 years after the death of Jesus. This makes John the youngest of the disciples and probably the last living apostle. At this point in his life, when he writes this letter, he started churches. He's been part of the evangelism, bringing the gospel, the good news of Christ to, to Asia, parts of Turkey. He's heard and he's seen his fellow disciples die for their faith. He's experienced persecution. He's seen the birth of the church. He was there at Pentecost when the Spirit comes and then sends people all across the known world. He's seen Christians fleeing persecution to all parts of the Roman Empire. John also experienced the challenges of heresy that came to threaten the infant church when the church was just meeting in people's homes. This letter was written to address conflict in the church and to teach Christians what they were to believe and how we as followers of Christ should behave in a world that is hostile to us. In Asia, at the time of John's writing, there were many conflicting religions. There was Gnosticism, there was Greek mysticism, there was the polytheism of Rome and the ancient Greeks. These are all just a few of, theology, of the theologies that threatened the church. And it was the early church. There were many religions that influenced thought and belief throughout the world at that time, but none of them were Christian. This was literally the, the beginning, the birth of the church. A particular threat that John was addressing in this letter is called Gnosticism. In Greek, the word for knowledge is gnosis. Gnosticism is the, the study or the worship of knowledge. And it was this idea that taught that thoughts were the highest idea. It comes from, from Plato's theory of forms, if you remember that from high school or college. It's the idea that thoughts and ideas were pure and true and good, but the physical world was broken and dirty because Gnostics thought that the way to being pure was through thoughts and ideas, they believed that you needed to find that right thought, have the right idea. Gnostics didn't deny Jesus, they just said that Jesus, because he was good, must have been a thought or an idea. He couldn't have really lived, he couldn't have died on the cross because that would be bad. And he couldn't have been resurrected because he, he was only an idea. It was a good idea, but that's as far as it went. And now, when John wrote, the Gnostics said, Jesus is gone, so it's time to move on to newer ideas, always looking for a better idea. Now, John had helped to evangelize the Greek and Roman world. And at this point in his life, he was old and he was retired. He had been exiled by Rome. He was the last living leader of the Christian faith, and he wanted to make sure that Christians understood 
the faith that they professed, and that they were threatened by this new theology that, that was a counterfeit. It claimed that Jesus had never been human, and that he only existed in idea or spirit. Gnosticism was the first real theological challenge to Christianity, apart from the Jews who opposed it because they felt that they were a spin-off of Judaism. So in the face of this heresy, John wanted his people to know who Jesus was, and he wrote these words in the first chapter of 1 John. So listen to the Word of God as it comes to us from 1 John. This is a lengthy text, but it is incredibly powerful. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not live in the truth. But if we live in the light and walk in the light, he is in the light, and we will have fellowship with one another. And the, and the blood of Jesus, God's Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the entire world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this amazing text, John, the last disciple of Christ, gives his testimony. He calls it like he sees it. He tells the truth to those who would distort it and counterfeit it. He says, this is what we believe, and this is how we live. He says, what I'm going to tell you is the truth. I know it's the truth because I've seen it. I've touched it. I've been there. It's the real truth. Whether you believe it or not, God came to this world in Jesus Christ. And because he came, we can know God, our creator. God became flesh so that you might be able to have a relationship with him. You may think the flesh is bad, but let me tell you, it's not. God became flesh in order that he might remove the sin, the brokenness, the stuff that separates us from him. And the darkness that infects all of creation. You may think that Jesus was just an illusion or a spiritual image of what is real, but I tell you, God is real, and he came in Jesus Christ. If we believe this, we live. If we recognize that our hope is in God, we live. This is the message of Easter. However, if we think that we are sinless, we are fools. He's saying, you Gnostics have it wrong. There's not a particular idea that you have to grab hold of. It's a relationship. God is real. He's not distant in, in spirit form. God is real. 
He is the light that chases out the darkness. And he's here. He's really here. And because he's real, we can have our lives really changed. The darkness can be chased out. That, my friends, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And John is not backing away from it in the face of persecution, in the face of death, in the face of lies and deceit. He says, it is what it is. I love this letter because of that. It is what it is, and John is not afraid to tell the truth. John knows it's the truth whether we believe it or not. You know, I used to think that we should be passive and nice and friendly about our faith. That if we offend people, they won't hear the gospel and the message will be lost on them. However, over time, I've learned that failing to tell someone the truth does them no favors. Simply avoiding the harsh reality of the truth allows people to live a lie. And lies hurt more than the truth. Followers of Jesus should never shy away from the truth. The truth is good. It brings light into the darkness. Failing to tell the truth does no, fa does, does no favors to anyone. Think about it. When we tell the truth of what Christ teaches, we create a worldview that changes who we are in the world around us. We as Christians believe that every human being is created in the image of God. And because you are a child of God, created in his image, adopted by him, because the Bible teaches that, we understand the value of every human being, everyone, even those who are broken. We also know that human beings are broken, so there is darkness in all of us and in all human institutions. And in, there is need for redemption, and that redemption comes in God and following God's teachings. That's good news. If we're looking for perfection in human beings, we will always be disappointed. Frankly, what I want is for people to tell me the truth, and I hope that I tell the truth. And when we find people telling the truth or culture telling the truth, we should support it. And when we find people who are not telling the truth, or our culture is not telling the truth, we should stand against it. We should do so in a way which is compassionate and recognizes that people who differ from us are still children of God, but we should not be afraid of the truth. It's, truth is not a political thing. People on both sides of the political aisle make mistakes. Sometimes they are wrong and sometimes they are right. And when they're wrong, we should call it out, particularly with our votes. And when they're right, we should support that. When, we are, when, when they are wrong, we should work for reform in our community, which is setting things right, not the destruction of other people, but correction. The failure to call out what is wrong just leads us to bigger problems. I can think of a few examples, and I probably will get letters for this, but, you know, I know our, our culture is struggling with how to identify gender. And frankly, I don't have a position on how adults should handle gender dysphoria. It's not something that I have to deal with in my life, so I'm not an expert. But not speaking out on behalf of children is wrong. Today there are states that are considering laws and courts in our legal system that are hearing arguments that will force a law in our culture that will allow children as young as five years old to decide their gender. The argument is that children of five should be allowed to make their own decisions, life-altering, irreversible decisions. That's not how God made us. God has put people in our lives to help guide us. They're called parents. Children are to be guided and cared for 
by morally sound adults. If I let my children decide who they were when they were five years old, my daughter would have chosen to be a kitten named Ray. Instead, it was my opportunity to love her and to help her learn that she is a special child of God. That's what parents do. I also know that our culture is completely divided over issues of race right now. And frankly, I think it is the wrong idea. The very idea that we would identify people by the color of their skin and make that their primary identity and then place value on that. One color is better than another or one color is evil because of its history is frankly wrong in the eyes of scripture. We are children of God and every child of God deserves to be treated as a child of God. Where there is injustice, that needs to be called out and set right. But we should not be judging people and identifying them by how they look or where they were born or how much money is in their pocket or the language they speak. We are children of God. And when our culture wants to identify us as anything less than that, it is time for reform. This is a difficult week with the trial that's going on. My prayer is that our country will get back to its roots and realize that we are all children of God. And there is brokenness in every human being that needs redemption, and there is goodness that needs to be honored. That's what John would call us to. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think it's time that we tell the truth. We cannot save ourselves. We need God. Maybe we need to follow John's example and preach the truth as we know it and as God has revealed it. I think the world needs to hear it, and it needs to hear it honestly. We don't need to be combative, but we need to stand up for grace, for second chances, for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which teaches one another that God loves us and sets an example that we ought to love one another. A failure to do that is a mistake. The truth is, this is the road we have been called to. It's the path that we need to stay on. The map is clear. But if we veer off our course, the map will mean nothing. And we will find ourselves somewhere where we don't want to be. Let us pray for our nation and for ourselves that we might follow the truth. Let us pray. Gracious God, call us back to righteousness. Help us to stand up and speak the truth. And God, let us do so compassionately, recognizing that we are all created in your image, that we are children of God. We pray this in Christ's name.